So today's webinar is all about uh, cybersecurity and data privacy. We all see that every single day we've heard about the iOS updates and, and all these things and it's prevalent and our data is in so many places. So um, it's really important for us to have an understanding how the law is protecting us as individuals and then how businesses need to understand as well. So we have an expert, um, Carla Elise, and uh, she is at Syracuse University and she's an SJC student and um, an expert um, in this field. And she has an awesome presentation for us that's gonna give us the ins and outs and, and understanding of what we need to know as individuals as it relates to the law. Also, we have our very own Professor Alexandre, who I am lucky enough to have in labor law class, but um, Interestingly enough, he has a bachelor's in engineering as well, and uh, very strong in business law, um, uh, not just labor law and employment law. So with that, I would like to kick off um, Ms. Cara Lelis and for the presentation. Thank you so much for the presentation, and I'm glad to be here and if you guys have any questions, I'm open to answer. If we don't have time to answer all the questions, as I said before, uh, I can receive emails and answer. We can schedule uh, a Zoom meeting to clarify whatever I want, you guys want. I'm here today to try to explain how to navigate in the data privacy and cybersecurity implications in terms of business and Taika knowledge. So yeah, it's an honor to me to be here. And as I said, I'm open for questions in the end and also to receive emails. So thank you, Alexandre and everybody who make this uh, webinar possible today. It's an honor to to work with you again, Alexandre. <laughs> Thank you so much. My pleasure. So can I start? Yes. Okay. So navigating cybersecurity law, uh, it's uh, one huge question now. And I'd like to start with this first slide where we can see that 83% of the organizations experience more than one data breach just during 2022. So uh, for companies, if you think you are not suffering a data breach, it's because you are not in compliance with regulations, you are not looking for your system and taking care of your data. If it is not today, it will be, it will be tomorrow. So it's a certainty that every company will suffer a small or big data breach at some point. So let's go to the next slide. I'm not controlling the slides, they are helping me. So please be a little bit patient with the slides. So in my first slide, we will cover the introduction to the keys of cybersecurity laws and regulations, the federal versus state laws, and the international considerations. So in terms of introduction, we are talking about uh, data protection laws, cybersecurity standards, and privacy laws, and also breach notifications laws. But what is the data protection law? What is the goal for of that. So the focus is on the protection of personal and sensitive data. For example, in the United States, we have the HIPAA, it's a Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act who regulates healthcare data. We have the Gromalich uh, Bill Act, it's GLBO, who oversees the financial uh, data. In terms of cybersecurity, we have many standards also. So the framework, such as the National Institute of um, Standard and Taika Knowledge, we call NIST, 
they offer like a framework who will provide guideline for organizations to manage and reduce the cybersecurity risk. You can go to their website and there you will uh, understand the focus of the National Institute of Standards and Technology. They will help the companies to identify, protect, detect, and respond and recover data breach. So it's a it's a excellent standard to take a look if you are um, a company who wants to be regulate uh, in terms of data privacy. In terms of privacy laws, I will give you just a short examples. You can go deep in my next slide. So we have, for example, the COPA. With a children online privacy protect uh, protection act, and we have the California online privacy protection act. All those regulations have the goal to protect kids who are um, in the website. COPA protect kids uh, under um, thirteen years old. So the goal of COPA is to um, give the parents the right to see what those websites who are receiving kids remotely uh, or to see which data they are collecting, how they are collecting, what data uh, my kids are sharing about themselves. So COPA is to protect those families and their kids. In terms of breach notification laws, many states, they have to implement laws that require business to notify uh, individuals and authorities in the, in the event of data breach. Probably you receive one letter saying, oh, you probably are part of a class action, there was a data breach in that bank or on Starbucks or, or any company. So Target, so they send you those letters. This is a notification and each stage they have different um, requirements in terms of those notifications. For example, in California, they have to uh, to say to the attorney general, the company have to inform the attorney general if the data breach compro was compromised, um, which personal information of California residents was compromised, and they have a specifically requirement of 45 days after the, the breach is discovered. So in California, you have 45 days and you have to inform the attorney general. But what about if I am in New York? So in New York, they say uh, in the most expedient time possible and without unreasonable delay. But what means unreasonable delay? Uh, what is the expedient time possible? They don't, they never clarify. So that is those gaps also for companies to go through. Uh, in Illinois, they have the same type of requirement as New York. Uh, so you have to look as a company for each stage. Now we have to talk about the federal versus state laws. Yeah, so it's complicated for companies to look in for all those differences. So the federal law, for, for example, the federal law, like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, they call CFAA, was approved in 1986, uh, and one of the was one of the primary federal laws uh, to set like a baseline for cybersecurity regulations across the country, and they apply for the whole United States as a federal law. There is also the Grama Leak uh, Bill, it's L, uh, GLBA. This one was enacted in 1999. It require, the requirements is specifically for financial institution to safeguard the personal and financial, um, and financial information of customers. That is also the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act, which CISA was passed in 2015. Uh, they encourage uh, to sharing cybersecurity treat uh, information between the government and privacy entities. Most of the companies, they are afraid to tell the government there was a data breach. But for big companies, they need to share because sometimes, for example, if you are a gas company and oil, um, 
they 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 have like the government as partner in those type of companies so they need to share with the government but also sometimes that is like types of crimes from different countries in terms of um, their breach like uh, from countries who are trying to install ip and um they are trying to block their system and we will stop the gas in one um, geolocalization, for example, they have those Easter territories. So it makes sense to talk with the government in those cases. And they they set all those regulations. But this is just the federal laws. We have also the state laws. So the individual states have their own specific cybersecurity laws and regulations. They can set different requirements in each state, what that means. For example, for instance of California Consumer Privacy Act, CCPA, they impose stringent um, privacy requirements where other states have totally different rules, rules. In Virginia, for example, they have their all data privacy regulations. Um, for example, the, in Virginia, they have the VCDPA, and they introduce the concept of sensitive data. And in California, they don't. So if you are in Virginia and you are in California, you have to comply with both states with different um, types of concepts also. In Virginia, uh, the sensitive data includes personal data such as biometric data, precise uh, geolocalization also uh, data, and they can be used for a unique uh, identification and imposes additional obligation for to process all this data. So as a company, uh, in terms of financial and in terms of the regulations, you have to look for all of that. You have to go through the federal law. After, you have to look in of where I'm selling, in which stages. So which, which New York are saying in terms of their privacy, what California are saying, what Virginia are saying. Sometimes they are similar uh, types of regulations, but, but sometimes not. Even the concept, sometimes it is different, as I said. Like in Colorado, they have also the Colorado Privacy Act. And allows, in Colorado, they allow consumers to opt out um, of the target in advertising. So you can say, I don't want you to collect my data. In California, they can say, I, I need to know which type of data you are collecting from me. So as a consumer, you have different rights. And it is not just that, you also have the industry specific regulations. Let's say you have a company and you are working health, for example. So you have the HIPAA, uh, and you have to comply with HIPAA. It, and it is not just health care. If a financial institution, you also have your own regulation. Uh, as I said, if you are dealing with kids, you have specific regulations for kids. Uh, so, yeah, you have to look. It's a patchwork in terms of regulations. That's why for companies, it's been uh, a challenge to be in compliance with data privacy. And let's say you are now a global company. You are not just selling in New York. So that is international considerations. We have like GDPR and here in the United States, they are always saying, talking about, about um, CCPA. But what GDPR means, it's a general data protection regulation. And the scope of uh, GDPR is enacted when in European Union, it's one of the most comprehensive data protection regulations globally. And it applies for business that process the personal data of uh, European residents. Regardless of the business location, this means if you are American company, but you are selling your products in Europe, you need to be in compliance with GDPR and their requirements are high. So 
the GDPR set uh, standards for data protection. For example, uh, they the consumers uh, they have the right to assess. They have they have the right to retify. They have the right to delete their data, and they have the right to data portability. It also mandates the instrument of data breach notification requirements. So there is a bunch of requirements for companies to be in compliance. They also have the notification requirements where they are saying with 72 hours of becoming aware of the breach, you have to communicate because they understand if the breach is likely to result as a high risk to individual rights and their freedom to control, uh, they will offer like additional details also in terms of compliance. So the whole thing is, is about the, the freedom, the right of freedom in Europe. And if the breach occur in the domain of the data processor, they are required to inform to the data controller. So, but in each country, they also have uh, different uh, data controllers. For example, if you are in the in UK, uh, you have the Information Commissioner Office, they call ICO, you have to inform to them. But if you are in France, they have the Commissioner National in, uh, Information Liberty. My French, it is not good, but so what I'm trying to say is the GPR is for the whole Europe, but in each country who is part of the European Union, they also have their own requirements. So it is not just complicated in the United States. Also in Europe, you have to look um, to those requirements in each country. But what everybody are talking about the GPR is about the penalties. If you are in non-compliance, uh, the amount can come of millions of euros, or because it's a percentage, it's a percentage of the company annual revenue. So if you suffer a data breach and you are not in compliance, they not you ask you for like oh okay are you looking for the damage no they you looking for the your annual revenue so you, you'll be expensive if you are not in compliance and when we are talking about the international environment we are for example in brazil we have we have the lgpd regulation it's a general data protection law so the LGPD in Brazil, it's the equivalent of, uh, uh, you can compare with GDPR in terms, in terms of data protection rights. They use the GDPR to inspire them to write the LGPD, but it's not exactly the same. For example, in Europe, they have the right to be forgotten. And in Brazil, they don't. Um, the LGPD applies for business to uh, processing personal data in Brazil, as well as international companies who are handling data in Brazil citizens. So it, it, it's similar to GDPR. And now you have um, all those regulations you have in Canada, Japan, China. And so it's a, a bunch of laws if you are a global company thinking about it, the costs of that to be in compliance with everything. And thinking about uh, the implications also to, to understand different types of regulations and requirements, you need to pay like one professional with all this expertise. So it definitely, it's a challenge for companies. In terms of uh, implications when you suffer a data breach for consumers, you you, you face loss of trust, regulatory investigation, they you look deeply inside of your company to see if you are in compliance or not. You have the financial consequence, the costs of the lawsuit, it is super high. You also have to look in for contractual, oblig contractual obligations, the rule of cybersecurity insurance. Insurance will help the companies to mitigate financial risks associated with those data breaches. 
but the company in terms of insurance they you and they need to see if you are in compliance if you're not in compliance they don't want to cover you so you need to be in compliance also to get a, a insurance to cover damages in case of a data breach so i can go with some case studies with um the group but for example i will give you like a short example about equifas the equifas um is one of the major credit reporting agencies in the united states and they suffer a massive data breach that expose um around one um 147 million individuals data and the legal consequence was like they had a settlement and they faced like a multiple class actions but they had a settlement in 2019 and the costs of the settlement they had to pay 700 million dollars in fines and compensations to affected consumers so this is what just one data breach and the consequences was um leading for regulatory scrutiny and the settlement of fines and reputation damage, operational and security improvements. They had to comply with many things. They were considering negligent. So it was a mess. So as a company, you don't need to face that. So the costs to implement cybersecurity, are, it is high, but also if you are not in compliance, it can be much worse. So that is also implications for uh, technologies. Sorry, uh, can we go to the to the next slide, please? Thank you. So the implications of technologies you you face, like for example, intellectual property in cybersecurity, regulatory challenges in developing security technology, compliance requirements to tech companies and the government access to technology encryption. So in terms of intellectual property, you have to, pro to protect your IP. You have the cybersecurity innovation to protect. You have licensing uh, in terms of compliance. Uh, in terms of regulatory challenges in developed security technology, you have diverse regulations. The tech companies often, um, they have to operate globally which means um, they must comply with a range of cybersecurity laws and protections and regulations, the regulatory compliance costs, and to ensure compliance with various, uh, various regulations can be super costly. The innovation versus the regulation. Companies must meet cybersecurity standards while maintain their, their ability to innovate also. It's a conflict to them. They have to be in compliance, but they need to still innovate in terms of technology. If not, uh, their competitors can be in front of them. In terms of compliance requirements for tech companies, we have like the data protection law, the data security standards, and we have to look to the consumer rights. So, and in terms of the government says in technology, they also you ask you for encryption policies. What is encryption? Encryption is when you turn like words in codes and there is a key which just the person who has a key can understand the codes. So uh, encryption is one um, recommended protection. We also have warrants um, in data requests. So the legal requests for user for users data and they need to have like clear protocols to handle such requirements while they are insurance user privacy. You have to communicate clearly with their consumers to say, I'm collecting this data, I'm doing this and that with this data. And the consumers, they need to understand, uh, you, you need clear policies. Um, the global reach, so uh, the tech companies with global users um, base must address the legal requirements of different governments and potential conflicts between uh, national security and um, user privacies. So you have to put everything in terms of data privacy in the balance, and you also have to look for innovation. It's a challenge to them. So... 
the implication, my next slide, please. So the implications for uh, finance, it's, um, they have compliance obligations, they have different acts, they have the risk management, and they have, for example, insider trading and cybersecurity treats. Uh, in terms of insider treats, they, uh, the employees or affiliates inside of the company, uh, you have to look for vulnerabilities with those uh, employees. In terms of data protection, you have to look for which uh, access they have, what they are assessing if they are inside of the company. The investments of due diligence also. You need to invest um, in cybersecurity. You have to invest in cybersecurity tools, um, personal training, and you have to stay ahead to uh, not be involved in those streets. You need to do due diligence to evaluate the cyber risk and potential acquisitions is vital uh, to avoid uh, unexpected vulnerabilities. And the impacts of financial in everything we're talking about, it is high. You have to invest in all those things to so doesn't suffer like the impact of financial market. You can cause like a panic in the marketing if you suffer like a huge data breach. And the costs of the marketing looking for your company and you can lose trust, you can lose clients, uh, you can cause panic in the marketing um, and have significant financial reputational damages and you have to face all those consequences. So I think I, I cover as much as I could, and I hope I could uh, explain like the basis of uh, the financial part and technology in terms of data privacy. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Carla, uh, Professor. Uh, Thank you, Carla. Gonna... Uh, I have some questions uh, for you regarding this. These things is a very it's a very uh, complex issue and it affects any type of business. As your in your last slide, you you talking about the financial liabilities and also uh, inside the trading and all the things. But I would like to know about uh, small business. How this uh, can affect and how small business can protect because they don't have a lot of money to make that data privacy. Uh, programs and cybersecurity, and many uh, small businesses they don't have uh, knowledge about the the liabilities. So, what you can give advice for small business for us? Well, for a small business, the challenge it is it is much bigger uh, because they don't have the budget to invest in all those um, cybersecurity uh, implementations. So, and usually they have no idea in terms of law. If they don't have someone with the legal knowledge in their team, it will be a challenge. So what I, I work in a project which call Make Data Safe with small companies. And my, usually my advisement to them is try to go simple. And first you need to understand which type of data you are collecting. So are you collecting sensitive data or not? So some companies, they feel like I need to collect everything, but they are not using that. For example, if you are not receiving payment online, why you are asking for debt card number? Uh, if you don't use like address, why are you asking for address? So that is a um uh, possibility to minimize data collection. That's the first thing in terms of my advisement to them, try to reduce the type of data you are collecting. Because once you are suffering a data breach, let's see, if you don't have credit card numbers, if you are not collecting cybersecurity, the risk of compromise and damage your customers, it is much less. But if you are going crazy and collect everything, you have to be responsible for everything. And are you encrypting 
this data. Once you are collecting uh, social security, debit card and credit card number, are you investing in encryption? If you are not, forget about the, the you don't have, you shouldn't collect this type of data. That is companies collecting uh, specific data that doesn't make any sense. When you go to Disney World now, for example, when you show up, they will ask you for face recognition. But why they need face recognition? Oh, it's to make sure you are in a safe environment uh, at Disney Park. Okay, but what about after? When I leave, what are you are doing with my data? So now we have to start to ask those questions. Why you are collecting this data and what you are doing with my data? Are you selling my data? Who is buying my data? How you know? Are you making money with my data without my consent? So we are going through all those questions. Data privacy some is something new, and there is a lot of questions around yet. But my first advisement for if I can offer some, uh, it's try to collect just what you want. Reduce the type of data. Minimize your data. And if you need this data, make sure you have encryption. Develop clear policies with our customers. Tell them um, what you are doing with their data. Tell them which data you are collecting. If you are crossing data, because now it's easy to cross data. You can go to any social media and collect whatever you want. It's a ton of data for free uh, in the marketing, you know but you are responsible as a company to manage everything. So yeah, those are the, the first uh, thing in terms of uh, small companies. And before, if you are not a big company and you are selling different states, ask professionals, what are the regulations in those states to make sure you are in compliance? Hey, thank you very much, Carla. I have another question for you is, uh, you are a lawyer in the, with expertise as a cybersecurity, but uh, a lot of people may work in this uh, realm that are not lawyers. So can you give some advice about how is the market? How is the, the type of background that the market is uh, needing? If there is any certification for no lawyers to participate in this market in the area of uh, cybersecurity or breach or data policy uh, related to cybersecurity and, and data privacy? Yeah, yeah. You don't need to be a lawyer to work in cybersecurity or in privacy. So, for example, if you are in IT, that is, I'm not in IT, so I, I can go just uh, until uh, those are the regulations. But if, for example, if you are an engineer, if you are in IT, if you are in business, but for example, if you need to work as a project um, a data secret uh, agent, you can take certifications um, to work to manage projects, for example, in cybersecurity. In terms of implementation, okay, I know all these regulations, but what about now? I have my system running, I need to put this in my system. I need to be in compliance with everything, but how I can implement all those regulations. So except to the law, that is all those um, softwares where which you, you need to, to look in through them to see if they are in compliance with those regulations. You need someone in IT to implement, so an engineer, and that is also certification for those professionals. If you are not a lawyer, you can you can't offer legal advisement, but you can work as a consultancy, for example. So there is a lot of ways to work in cybersecurity and data privacy now. You can be a professor and teach uh, about those regulations. Yeah. As a professional, that is, you can develop softwares. The marketing needs like software to help these people to be in compliance much more faster. That that is a, a, a huge market for professionals in terms of cybersecurity and data privacy for sure. I 
I can listen um, more. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, we'll um, we got some Q and A. We got some questions. We have some questions so. from from the students here. Uh, Mark, please, uh, can you uh, start with that? Thank you very Absolutely. much for your answers, fellow. Yeah, and thank you for the presentation. It's um, it's robust. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, from Kishore, um, you know, what are some of the sources of data breaches? You know, what are the different mechanisms that create a data breach? Well, usually hackers are looking for small companies. People think they are looking for big companies, but they're not. To breach like a huge company because they have all the infrastructure uh, implemented and they have professionals and budget to take care of that, take years sometimes to, to break the system. It's an investment that is companies outside the United States paying people. Ha Hacker is a professional now. So Eric Coolidge is one of the authors who are writing a, a lot of things in terms of um, cybersecurity. He was explaining that in some countries where people call and they said, oh, you suffer a data breach, we can help you. You can pay $80 and we will give you back all your data. And if you are not satisfied, we can give you money back. It's like a customer yeah. service when they breach your system. So that is this crazy thing running now. And uh, the, the thing in terms of being a small company is because you don't have too much protection, it's easy to them to break your system. It doesn't mean because you have one, two or three employees, you don't have a massive data. Some small startups, they have billions of data. They are just crossing data from everywhere. And it's important to them to collect that. They are not looking for your money. They are lo they are making money with the data you were able to collect. That's why the data privacy regulations come to impose uh, rules to all types of companies. Doesn't mean because you are small, you don't have a massive amount of data now. Right. That's interesting. In, uh, you know, in my business, I'll receive an email that looks like it's from Meta, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it doesn't go just to me, it goes to others. And I recognize the little intri intrinsic things that are different. And I to, then I have to tell everybody, do not click, you know. Um, so it's pretty wild how they are getting creative with how they get in. Yeah. One of the protocols that I have been working is to help companies to create a culture of data privacy because people think because you are a big company, you are 100% covered, but you are not. So sometimes you have like, I don't know, 300 employees work for you and you have all the investment in terms of cybersecurity, but one employee, he was training, but he's not part of the culture to protect and he doesn't understand or she doesn't understand the the culture of data privacy and they can just click in one link and you you compromise right. all the the work and the investments of this company and it is not because he didn't receive the training it's not because they didn't uh invest it, it it's it's about the the culture you know uh it's everybody in the same page so i need to make sure that all this investment will come, you know, for something positive in the end. And, and, and that's the challenge that is no sure about what someone else is doing. So it, it's a constant investment. It's the, mm -hmm. it's the investment uh, in law, it's the investment in IT, it's the investment in HR, you know, data protection is something that you involve the whole company. Right. Uh, another question is, how would you suggest identify uh, how theft could be prevented from the security of a small business to large companies? So what are some of the ways 
you know, that are maybe small steps to, to actually start protecting the data. Yeah, the first step is you, you need to change password all the time. You have to change like weekly, depends which type of data. Maybe they can recommend you to change like every day, which it is, I, I, I can't believe people you do that every day. But so the recommendations usually start uh, once a week. And after that, uh, you have to create the, that, that's part of the culture. We need every week to change and you can impose that out so they can open the computer if they didn't change like every Friday, uh, for example, their passwords. And that, that's the minimum requirement in terms of protection. And they need someone to look into their system because if you start to look to your system, you see that every day you are seeing minimal trying to break your system. You need, you need protection in all machines in your company. And with this remote work, it's been a challenge now also because they need to use the company computers but the company, the small companies, they are not investing in offering computers to their employees. So usually, this these computers they are not protected. Uh, that is the cookies that you are accepting or not. So there is um a whole protocol to follow, which is not expensive. It is just uh you taking care of your small business. Yeah, but it but are basically things you take time and you need to help your employees to understand this process. It's maybe five or ten steps uh, just to start. I like that idea of a culture of data privacy and cybersecurity. It's uh, that makes sense, right? Because one person, like you said, can impact the entire business. Right, if there isn't a culture, yeah, yeah, and that's a huge. Even as I said, even for big companies, create the culture is difficult. It's a challenge yeah. to them because you need to make our people understanding as a team the impact of you know doing something wrong. They have the process to report. Oh, I saw this email. Doesn't look well for me. What do you think? Yeah. So yeah, they 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 need to develop like the whole protocol and yeah. help them create the culture also. I got a couple more questions. Um, here's one. So I'm just gonna read the entire thing. This is from Lonnie. I work for a semiconductor company with 14,000 plus employees worldwide. We have regular tests, random, but usually every month uh, our internal IT conducts. They are fake security tests like emails with your manager's name uh, from my, or from Microsoft. They do this to promote this culture uh, of discernment. And before anybody of discernment before anybody actually clicks on anything. So if you click on an internal phishing fake, uh, you get a warning. After the second time, you have to take the internal training. More than three times, you're at risk of losing your position. That's a pretty interesting approach. So that's culture right there. It's interesting. Uh, that's pretty cool, Lonnie, that they're, they're doing that. Um, in the future, is there any automation um, that can AI play a role in cybersecurity and data privacy? Is there, is That's that a conflict. That's a conflict because AI is excellent, it's great, but the companies are saying, you are not allowing our employees to use AI anymore because each open door for the internet outside, it's uh. a chance to be break. So, that's a conflict. So, so what if you build your own internal machine? Can you build yeah. your own internal machine that would actually build out your entire infrastructure from a security standpoint? Yeah, it, it was private, not public. 
yeah but the cost of that sometimes doesn't make sense to invest in this yeah. high technology to have your own artificial intelligence for example with close right. more, you know because the proposal of the AI for most of this company is to help them to collect more and fast data to be more productive and you know be fast and take the advantage yeah. to 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 work faster than your competitors but do you want to take a risk of use those artificial intelligence once you know that you are taking and investing in all these measures to protect your company and if you open this back door you can be hacked so it's a conflict some companies the are ai can turn on you and, and hack you yeah right i have been of uh, talking with many companies and they are saying no ai in my company no ai it, it's a conflict right yeah that's interesting so we have um one question that's interesting thinking about next year um you know, what'll be some of the biggest challenges that we face as individuals and businesses as it relates to cybersecurity and data privacy? You know, what's coming down the pike that we should be aware of from a challenge standpoint? Well, in terms of law, I think they individually is different, but in general, I think the in terms of law, the, the biggest challenge for companies it's first understand all these patchwork regulations. If if I, I if I need you to be a global company, from where I should start? From my I'm selling here in this stage. I'm selling the whole United States. You have to go step by step. Now I'm I'm selling in Europe before data privacy. You could just go fast and sell everywhere. Yeah. But now you can't do that anymore. Right. So uh, as a business, you have to think in, makes sense for me to sell in California and face all these regulations or not. Maybe right. I should go to New York. And, you know, people will start to think about that. So makes sense for me as American company to sell in Europe. Yeah, probably makes sense. I, I will increase my annual revenue. That's what I'm looking for. But you need to make sure you can invest to be in compliance because the cost is it is high. The lawsuits, some companies, they are imposing uh, uh, regu uh, requirements in their contracts that you can um, uh, sue me in a class actions. You need to go to a settlement. They are trying to put barriers in terms of class actions. And those but are you, watchdogs? Are those like private watchdogs or are those actually government agencies that are? No, private companies. Okay. Private, companies. private companies are imposing uh, threats for, of suit. For consumers, yeah. Yes. But as an individual, I right. think the as an employee, the challenge is... As he said, I have those three steps. I have to report, and if I click in the link, and if that is a threat, they are testing me. I'm afraid of losing my job. Uh, I, I know people who lose their jobs. Yeah. And this is not a, what I call the culture of data privacy. If we start to make people scared in the environment, that you feel like this is a nightmare for me. I have all my job to handle. It now comes with this data privacy shoe with me. So, you know, in this thing about saying, oh, if in the third time you click in the wrong link, uh, you lose your position. I, I don't think it is this great a culture. You have to educate mm. people. You Interesting. Have to educate. So Lonnie's statement, you don't think that is positive thing for culture. It might be a good thing for a business to practice to make sure it keeps itself safe, but it's not a culture act. It is not because they are losing good professionals. 
Because mm. doesn't mean because you watch a three, four videos, you understood the implications of a data breach in your company. They are mm. thinking about their unique job. If you are like an engineer, they know about the engineer part. If you are an HR, you know about the, but they don't know sometimes the implications of the institution as a like a whole company. Yeah. So and that's that's the culture. You know, as an employee, your data is there. They are paying right. you. They, they know your social security number, they know your address, they know your phone number, and your friend who are close to you, they have this data also. And because you are clicking the link, you are compromised, not the company data, but your own data, your friend's data. You can make this life a nightmare if a hacker start to, uh, you know, installing his money and call, um, to talk about his family, they will feel unsafe, you know, that's the culture. Right. Yeah. You need to understand the whole scenario, not about, oh, how much money the company you lose if I click in the link. They think, oh, the company has a lot of money. They can handle that. Right. But, but this is not about, the, this is not the culture. The culture is really understand. That's why the education program inside of the company make much more sense than just sending videos. Watch this. This is your problem. I don't need to take care of that. I just, I bought these videos. You have to watch that. And if you click three times in the link, you are out of the company. This is not the culture. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. What about um, third party? You use, for example, a company called Clavio does email marketing so that it, it collects information. Um, some of it, it can, can collect automatically from yet another source. So it'll collect name, email, phone number, address, uh, IP address, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So is a company compliant because it's coming from a third party? Right. So if Sam Smith that sells apples uses Clavio to collect email addresses for his newsletter, is he compliant? Yeah, he wrote the privacy thing and all that jazz. But if there's a data breach at Clavio, what is the liability for Mr. Smith that sells apples? If any. If 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 he is collecting data and he's storing data, it is in his own company, he needs to be in compliance. Doesn't matter if he's collecting public data because your company is the one who are suffering the breach. That's the question? Yeah, so <clears throat> who's liable? If you're using a third party that's collecting and storing the data, but you use it, let's say you license the use of it, the person who you, suffer a data breach is liable. Got it. That's right. why I said minimize the collection yeah. of data. Once right. your company collects this data, doesn't matter if it is a public data or it's a you know or not. If you're collecting data, you are responsible for the data you are collecting. So one way to collect a lot of data and not be liable for it is to tap into third parties to store it for you. Is you can that, pay for third true? party to store for you. You can yeah. pay. It, that's make your life easier, but you are still responsible. You are still responsible because yeah. you went by the act of asking and saying, hey, give me this. Got it. Yeah, because who is the person with interest in collecting this data? If you are paying someone, this person, mm -hmm. he is liable also. Yeah. But he's, he, he took the data that you asked him to get. Right. You are paying, but you are taking the measures. That's the good part. So if you are paying someone, you know, to store your data, it's because you are taking measures. I don't need to be responsible because I know the investment for me is not possible. So yeah. I'm paying a third party to take care of that. So right. 
I'm being responsible. Mm. I'm not being negligent. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Let's uh let's transition to reflection time. Just have a couple more minutes left and would love to hear from anybody that um um you know anything popped up for them. I know some stuff popped up for me and I'm, I'm happy to share, but I would love to hear from from the group. You can just pop it into chat. You can raise your hand and maybe we can give you the mic. Um I can talk quickly while, you know, one of the things, it's interesting, you know, the culture thing really resonated with me because what I'm doing now um, is educating people as it comes in just because I recognize it because I see it all the time um, when a phishing email comes in and, but creating a culture, right, it's super that's a thoughtful way to really go about it so that I'm not the only police person. Uh, everybody else, you know, actually yeah. saying, Oh yeah, I want to understand and educate myself. Um, because one, I am a consumer that has data that's out there, but then two, I am a ambassador to this company and I want to protect our customers data as well. So I need to act a certain way, you know, um, yeah. I haven't thought of it that way, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Usually companies, they don't because it's a lot of energy, you know, to educate people. But the, one way to help them to understand it is the study cases. So in terms of recommendations for those companies, I could say they need to like to improve their risk assessment first, assess and identify potential vulnerabilities. If you identify yeah. your potential vulnerabilities, you can work in those. And you can do like data classification, which it is uh, your strategy should include a classification system that helps to determine how sensitive data is handled, how is stored, how is assessed. So that's right. data classification. You can you need like an incident response because as I said, 83% of the company suffered more than one data breach just, just in 2022. So you need to develop an incident response protocol uh, to recover and develop strategies. Um, in, just in case. Yeah, and looking for the legal compliance measures. You need the security framework as well. So it's a implement and recognize the framework such as the NIST that I said, the National Institute of Standard and Technology. They have a huge um, website explain what business should do to protect themselves. It's 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 wonderful uh, resource. You ha we have the. Uh, the guides of cybersecurity measures, all those frameworks provide comprehensive guidelines for the best practices. So we have the way, you know, to research right. and do that. I'm not saying it is easy, but but it's necessary. If you don't have the budget, for example, here in Syracuse, you have the Innovation um, Law Center who can offer like a C, uh, it's not a free service, but it's a reduced price. And yeah, you, you, you if you take your time to look to that, you can you can go through. That is also like, as I said, places in terms of collaboration. Uh, some states they are offering free services for small companies to be in compliance. Uh, that is. A lot of trainings available online where I'm not saying they are all useful and good for your company, but for sure you can find something that you can improve and train your employees. That is always something in terms of recommendations that you can adapt for your company. And it's important to continuous monitoring. You have to monitoring, monitoring mm -hmm. all the time to see uh, how your system uh, is working. 
do ongoing assessment, change the password, looking for the legal updates, looking yeah. for the available tools to protect your company. Never use free tools. If you use free tools, they are collecting data from you. Right. It's awesome. Great. Thank um, you, Carla. <clears throat> I think I think it's interesting too what you say, and uh, I see people here uh, from my students telling that it was very interesting the presentation, and they didn't realize how deep this uh, subject can be. And I think it's not an issue about the culture of the company or, or you uh, culture of that company, but it's uh, learning for everybody because even as personal individual, we are all connected today. And we have a, a expansion today about uh, the way that our lives became more uh, digital after the pandemics and all the things that are working in this world uh, of technology now. So it means that we have to be aware by ourselves, not what expecting the company direct us, our employee to tell, oh, you should do this or should do that, not, but uh, it's a it's a continuous learning of the how this is gonna shape the culture of how we exchange information between ourselves. Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation. And thank, thank you for um, the opportunity. Mark, can you wrap up? Yeah, so I really um I got a lot out of this and really appreciate both of you. Um Carla, you educated us in, in a way that um is very important. And um, as MBA students, and then as some of us are business owners, and um, <clears throat> I just want to share one takeaway, and then we can all get on with our our Saturdays from uh, Kishore. Um, what he got out of, out of it was uh, educate yourself on cybersecurity, personally and professionally. Uh, I think it's very important. Build a culture of security and protect yourself from daily online scams by being to uh, diligent. So you know, that's a great synopsis of what are some takeaways that we can bring into our lives today. So again, thank you very, very much. And um, people can reach out to you. Of course, of course. Okay, great. So we'll uh, provide that information and um, everybody have an awesome Saturday and, and uh, see you all soon. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm glad to answer any questions. If anyone wants to email me, I will be glad to answer. If you want to have like a Zoom meeting, I'm open to that also. And awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I'm glad to be here today. Thank you.